So I was asked to talk about, um, you know, the idea of shelter in place versus evacuation. And uh, it's maddening from what I've seen before. It's just like, you see me, I'm screaming at the Thomas fire. I'm on the one-on-one, you know, this is going on because it, it's a, it's a horrible, horrible, just difficult situation. And people commonly ask me, well, what's the best thing to do? Tell me what to do. And it's like, I give always the same exact pat response. Like I give my students which if I can figure out how to make the channel is it depends <laughs> it, no matter anything within fire, whether it's for emergency management or for fire ecology, it's always a, it's depends uh, sort of scenario. And when it comes to shelter in place versus evacuation, it, it's complicated because there's so many factors as site specific. So if you take a sort of a broad brush approach and just say, Oh, this is what we should all be doing. You know, we're destined to fail. But I think the important thing is uh, to realize that most, you know, just about everyone in California at some point in their life, if they live in some sort of a uh, area in which there is, um, you know, wildland fuels, you know, you're not in downtown San Francisco or the places, you know, you're going to be impacted by wildland fire, by, uh, you know, uh, situation. And even within, I've seen this in, in other areas where, you know, you could be in an urban area, but you've got a park, it's an occluded park. And I've seen fires start in the, um, the, the wildland portion of the park and then spread out and damage homes, um, you know, and, and threaten people uh, right there at the periphery of that. So it's not an easy situation. So the, the goal for me today is to kind of give you a sort of a story about what's kind of led me to where I'm going, sort of a, a little bit of the history uh, about, you know, shelter in place versus evacuation we're going on. And then talk about, you know, just some generalities, because it, in the end, it, it comes down to, you know, your personal decision, you know, given the circumstances. Now, just to let you know through the long history I've had, I, I've changed my sort of my paradigm and my thinking, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but I was at Black Saturday in Australia when that happened in 2009, killed 172 people, and I really just spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, hey, you know, uh, what would I do with my own family? You know, there, there's something I can do with myself, but what would I do with my own family? And in the areas, you know, where most of the folks, you know, that that we're addressing here are folks that are into um, livestock and other sorts of animals, you know, the, the rangelands, um, just the way that they're designed, uh, you know, with a, whether it be shrubs or especially the grasslands, they burn very, very quick and your environment can be changed very, very quickly as well. Now, in the historic approach to wildfire in the U.S., um, at least in the last... 50 years. It, it's been, in my opinion, sort of an over-reliance by the fire service. And I, I've talked to folks uh, uh, before. It's like, hey, you know, what are you going to do if a fire breaks out? It's like, well, I'm going to call 911. You know, they're, they're going to come. And, in, and I've seen some of that a little bit, you know, about the same with the fire service. It's like, hey, you know, firefighters, of which I was one at, uh, earlier in my career, um, you know, it's like, hey, we've got this. Let us be uh, the good guys here. But I think that we're finding that this is rapidly changing, both from a residential perspective as well as by the fire service. It's just we have, as we've seen just this week, you know, there are so many fires and uh, it's such a broad area is that you certainly just, the fire service is not going to show up. There's not going to be a fire truck in your driveway. Um, so, and I think I'm recognizing this, you know, from both the residents, they're recognizing a little bit more of a personal approach, not just relying on being saved by the good guys, but the fire service is also uh, happily saying, it's like, hey, you know, we got, we're, we want to be Superman, but we got our kryptonite as well. And so recognizing that uh, they can't be in all places at all times. And so there is that need for personal responsibility. Um, and that's so important from the residents um, and, you know, from livestock owners and others, uh, because again, it, it's, it's unlikely that you're going to have a fire truck in your driveway, especially under these very fast moving high intensity fires uh, that we've been seeing. So just give you a little idea is just kind of what's kind of shaped my paradigms through the year. It's like, uh, I start looking at, I'm just now starting my 20th year. Oh my goodness. That's a uh, Cal Poly. And when I first arrived there, they had a fire there. And, you know, I came from um, the Gulf Coastal Plain. I was living in Baton Rouge of all places. So I'm coming to California going, wow, you know, fire, this is like a big deal. And this whole idea of the wild and urban interface was kind of foreign to me, honestly, at the time. I was trained more in ecology and, uh, and vegetation management. 
But this fire broke out and I was reading the newspaper account of it, you know, it's a little 60 acre fire. And it said there in the newspaper, you know, evacuation of homes at the edge of a residential development were ordered early Friday. But then it struck me afterwards, it's like, well, there was no sense of panic in the intervening hours or even evidence that mass evacuations actually took place. Some residents were off to work, others drove to drive, uh, spoke to their neighbors in driveways, reported what was happening on their cell phones and whatnot. So it really struck me, you know, in the early 2000s, so like, why the heck are we calling for evacuations? Um, and I, I was kind of aware of the Australian method. We're kind of looking at where they are purposely trying to uh, defend their homes. Uh, they're part of the fire service. They're not looked at as something that uh, is going to hinder the, the, the efforts of fire suppression, but actually might be able to be used as a resource. So that kind of struck me. And, and also another thing that kind of came in was thinking about, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of data uh, looking at evacuations. They're having, uh, you know, been in the fire service, been a firefighter and dodging, rolling logs down mountains and whatnot in vehicles. Um, it it's, can be crazy, crazy uh, scary, especially for someone that doesn't have any sort of experience or training. So I want to show you a video that uh, probably some of you have seen from, um, you know, just an evacuation. This was from um, the, the um, uh, the fire in paradise, the, the campfire, and these are folks that are driving through, and you can see just the smoke and the panic and the terror that's in there, not, you know, not knowing what's around the next corner, and then as soon as they drive through it, it's like, oh, it's all better. So it's like you're putting these situations, you don't know what's coming next, and so this kind of shaped a little bit, you know, earlier as well. So let's take a look at this real quick, this minute video. Heavenly Father, please help us. Please help us to be safe. I am thankful for Jeremy and his willingness to be brave. So you can see right now, you know, it's like all of a sudden out of nowhere, there's a car that's kind of coming through that could, you know, it's, it's been known to entrap people. The smoke is there. You can sense the panic that's absolutely going through these folks' mind. And they're like, you're coming up. Uh oh, I see, you know, stop. is there some sort of a, a block that's here? And all of a sudden it's like, uh oh, we're just about to enter the apocalypse. And then magically not knowing all of a sudden they're through it. And so looking at this sort of thing, this is looking at, uh, you know, this, these folks coming through here. It, there was a, a lot of evidence of people dying during the evacuation itself. So it, I started looking at the Australian method. I started seeing these things like, ah, you know, maybe we should look at potentially looking at sheltering your homes. Now I'm going to show you sort of the alternative to that is... Um, here is some folks in Australia that they are purposely, um, you know, they put themselves in harm's way as sort of the, the stay and defend method here. So these people have been, they've got all the equipment that they need. They actually have a water pump inside their house. But let's take a look real quick. You can, uh, you know, just the, uh, the immensity of the fire coming through. And I think that uh, uh, what Steve Quarles was showing about the, uh, the embers can be shown here, uh, just going through the windows. And so these are people that are completely prepared. They've got all the right equipment, all the stuff, and you can see just the ember storm that's coming through. And it's, it's terrifying. And these are people that have also done a lot of work, you know, kind of preparing the property as well before the fire event got there. Language warning. Oh, sorry. Oh, look at it. Got the. Oh. Hold that door. Hold the door. Don't let them come in the game. Yeah. So you can see that ember shower is coming through oh, there. The, the wind's God, coming through. Yeah. She's still going to go here. It's going to be massively hot in here in a sec. Yeah. It's fucking hot. It's real bad. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna be handy in a minute. Yeah. Go on, piss off. Burn and piss off, will you? So notice the ember storm trying to get anywhere and everywhere inside the house. You go to it down the back. Stay away from the glass, mate. Yeah, I'm just fucking cutting my cover. Okay. Good job we had the long back. All right, it's just a strain. Oh, yeah. 
where the fuck did those boys go? <laughs> so I'll stop it right there, but you can just sort of see, you know, these are folks that had prepared their property, done everything they possibly could in terms of uh, managing the vegetation, providing defensible space. And you saw that even though they had done everything, this a firestorm came through and has just put them in very, very scary, scary conditions. So again, what do you do? Do you shelter? Do you get out? You know, uh, sort of thing. And we see that both of the, the ways that uh, going about it, whether you stay or you go, you're you are potentially in peril's way. Language. So, you know, after the, uh, you know, I've started kind of getting this idea, you know, about, uh, again, the Australian method, and we'll see that it kind of changed a little bit. And we saw that shelter in place, at least in California, was uh, at least temporarily legitimized in 2007 uh, during the Witch Creek Fire. Uh, that happened down in San Diego. And Rancho Santa Fe, uh, a very, very well-to-do community in which the uh, median house price is over $15 million. Um, you know, they, they put a lot of effort into creating specific communities that were listed as shelter in place. And the idea was, is that if a large fire came through, which it does in that particular area, um, is that you would be able to survive that, uh, that place. So actually we find that this was, uh, you know, during this fire that uh, where you had all this massive loss during the Witch Creek fire, um, there was zero homes in the, the specific communities that were developed as a shelter in place community in, um, in, uh, uh, in this area. So I talked to a gentleman that came through in this house. You can see that uh, the, there certainly was damage. You see the tempered glass uh, windows they have there on the screen door. They've done all the things, right? They've got stucco siding. And uh, yet the fire kind of creeped up in just tiny, tiny mulch, came up to, the, uh, to these weep screens at the bottom here and actually started to ignite the house. This house was actually saved by a guy that stayed behind. He sheltered in his house and he came out with just a garden hose, you know, and was able to spread out. And if he wasn't there, um, it was, uh, it was, that house was toast. So, you know, a lot of times the two, when they were coming through, the, the folks were coming out at Rancho Santa Fe when this come through, it's like, hey, we're in a shelter in place community and you, you called us with the reverse 911 and, and you told us to get out. What, what the heck, what are you doing? And so part of the idea was with the Rancho Santa Fe Fire Department was again to kind of covertly provide options. You know, the first option, because we just don't know what people are going to do during a wildfire, uh, was to get out. But if you can't get out, uh, because, you know, you're driving through these long, twisty roads with chaparral on the side, it's like this would be an alternative. This would be a better plan than trying to get out um, on uh, a nasty fire as it's rolling through under extreme conditions. So I was really on board with the whole shelter in place. I saw it, you know, worked with uh, the Rancho Santa Fe Fire Department, you know, uh, doing a lot of things with them and just really excited about this. And I was like, yay, yay, yay. And then I went to Australia and I was living down there during the Black Saturday fires. And um, during these fires, they had uh, the Black Saturday fires. Uh, it completely destroyed multiple homes that were um, within um, uh, not even multiple homes, multiple entire communities. It was uh, akin to what we saw in Paradise, where it was house to house spread, uh, largely via embers, uh, you know, kind of a, the initial ignitions. And we can see that through just like uh, uh, Steve was showing earlier with the, the photos where the houses are completely burned. But if you look at the trees, eh, they're scorched. And a lot of times they're scorched by the, the trees uh, themselves. I mean, uh, the trees are scorched by the houses. And so that had a huge, huge impact on me in that way, because I saw that 172 people died and almost all of them, it was absolutely needless. Um, you know, they were trying to defend completely undefendable homes, you know, houses that were built back in the 50s with nothing with fire in the mind. And so my analogy is, it's like, hey, it's almost like, let's build our house on top of a train tracks and let's try to defend against this locomotive coming down. And as we see there, the train wins the vast, vast, vast majority of the time. So what do you do? You know, you've got the idea that there's a, you know, uh, if you go out on the road, you know, you're potentially, you're going to be burned over. If you stay in the house, it could be burned over. And so what do you do? Well, it depends. It, it depends on the situation uh, and what you're working on. So no matter what it depends on, though, what, uh, whatever approach you're taking, it's like you have to prepare this battlefield. You're thinking about fire as a, uh, you know, this, this enemy that you're trying to do it. 
And so sort of the analogy, I don't know if you any remember this uh, from the early 2000s, it was a really cute uh, romantic comedy, the movie 300 <laughs> coming through. Uh, but in this movie, if you, if you haven't seen it, there was a place where you've had these Persians, uh, you know, millions and millions of these Persians coming to attack the Spartans. And uh, so we're gonna look at this, this uh, massive horde coming through. The Persians are gonna equal, you know, the fire itself. Well, there were only 300 Spartans that were there and they effectively fought off for a very long time, this massive horde. And so you can imagine uh, the Spartans here, that could be the firefighters or, you know, if you're a resident or, or a rancher that's out there, uh, you know, you're trying to take on this horde. And if you just try to take them on without doing anything, this movie could have been 3,000. It could have been 30,000. You know, just by adding more people out there, it wasn't going to help uh, a really significant outcome. But instead, you know, what happened was, is that these Spartans, these 300 Spartans, were able to significantly um, resist uh, the Persians there, this million person army that's going on. And it's because they chose on how they were going to fight the battle themselves. Uh, they didn't let the enemy dictate how uh, they were gonna fight. They were kind of choosing, they were preparing that battlefield that were gonna make them most successful. So when you're preparing for battle, there's things that you've got to do if you're trying to shape that battlefield. You know, Steve already talked about, you know, defensible space with preparing vegetation. That is awesome. It's great. It helps. Um, sometimes, you know, preparing the structure. You see the bottom left-hand photo right there. Uh, I don't think that uh, the vegetative fuels is a problem here. But again, as we see, it's sort of the house-to-house -house spread, which happens. But no matter what happens, you know, in terms of pre uh, preparing, you know, you've got to also prepare with like any good army, like uh, with the retreat. Uh, how are you going to get out, you know, out of this dangerous situation? And unfortunately, there's so many places are like this. This is a photo from uh, um, up in the Lake Tahoe area, is that you've got just enormous amounts of uh, windy, twisty roads. And this is, uh, you see this a lot of times in um, the ranching community, more rural kind of substandard roads. And according to uh, public resource code for California, all you need is secondary access. So you could have 10,000 people up in this particular community, but hey, we've got uh, access to the north and we've got access to the east, we're golden. But as we all know, um, you know, this is a choke point. Even on a good day, just, uh, you know, you're trying to get out, there could be certainly traffic jams that are there. So preparing your vegetation, preparing, you know, the structures itself, you know, considering about the retreat. But one thing that is crazy difficult is how do you prepare for this mentally? And I, I bring up this photo. This is a photo I took uh, at the, the Black Saturday fires. And this is one of the survivors in the town of Marysville. And this was sort of the town patriarch, the one that owned half the town, you know, it's a man's man, you know, uh, and he was a, a rancher by trade. And you see that he's done everything for the most part right. You know, he's cleared out the vegetation. He's got five foot of uh, uh, clearance, complete concrete all around. Uh, he's got a brick house. He's got enclosed eaves in there. And talking to him, this guy that again was sort of the man's man, he was just, just crying, just could not, uh, can, uh, stop from sobbing because he was telling me it's like it was an absolute terror for the him uh, for like six to eight hours that he was battling embers trying to get into his house and so this is a person that kind of pull yourself up by the bootstrap person and he said there's no way he would ever ever do this again and so you can't prepare for this mentally honestly until you actually go through it uh, itself so with anything that you do, whether you, um, you uh, shelter in place, if that's the thing, or if you're trying to evacuate, which is what I suggest doing, get the heck out of there. Your life is way, way more important uh, than your house. And it, it means so much more. But have a plan and have a backup plan as well because stuff happens. And that's sort of the PG-13 way of doing that. And this kind of came into play as examples just me last week uh, during the Creek Fire. So this is a fire that uh, the night before there was, um, uh, we had some really, really rowdy neighbors up and this is uh, the dam uh, for Edison Lake. And so we decided, you know, I, I can't stick next to these people again. They're, they're just driving me nuts. So we're gonna go find another place to camp for the night. So it's like, hey, before we go, let's take one last look at the Vista point out there. And it's like, huh, I got up there and I noticed, hmm, 
there's a smoke plume starting to develop here. It's like 10.30 in the morning. And this is the only way out. I, I've noticed that this is about, you know, the, the, the route to get out. It's a uh, sort of a one lane, a high clearance road to get out in that place. And, you know, I had zero warning whatsoever, but it's like, you know, my, my spider, my, my fire, uh, spider senses were going off and it's like, you know, I, I need to know more and I need to kind of like, this, this could be potentially serious. And so just kind of showing you how quick this came uh, and how big this got, uh, you know, I'm coming down the road, nobody knew anything about a fire. I mean, it was absolute zero warning. And this is way, way, way common. I mean, and I've seen this in Europe, I've seen it in Australia. We obviously see this in the US and California is like they're, they're very oftentimes there is no warning. And so I had a breathing impaired wife that's through here uh, that was with me. And it's like, I'm not going to sit around, you know, with this because I know that smoke could be an issue. I felt safe in the mostly dry lake bed that would be uh, Lake Edison, but we started going down and it was just crazy to me. And I've been doing this for 30 years, how fast this thing grew up. And so you can see the photo just two hours later as I'm coming down the road. This is like 30 minutes before the, the fire is going to come across. So uh, across the road, that would have trapped me off. So my initial plan was get the heck out because I've got a wife with health problems. We need to get her off the mountains. Uh, but my plan B, I had a backup plan with that, was like, if I can't make it down here, if I'm going to be entrapped, I'm not going to be driving through this nightmare. I'm going to go back to that mostly dry lake bed. And it's very crazy uncomfortable. It, uh, I know it would have been a lot of uh, smoke and issues, and, but I it would have been survivable. Um, similar to what we saw there at Mammoth Pools, where people were hella backed out, you know, at the last second. Um, you know, people, it's, it's, it's crazy terrifying, but some of the videos we saw, you know, there's a guy that doesn't have a shirt. So it's survivable, crazy, crazy uncomfortable, and will scare you out of your mind. So all that is just kind of showing you sort of the, the idea is like me knowing what I had to do at that time, or at least, you know, having a plan and a backup plan I've got out there. You know, if you have livestock, um, this is significantly, you know, complicating the issues. Uh, and if you own this, you recognize that you, first of all, you've got to get them, you know, get to uh, your critters out there. And of course, you know, the animals, if there's fire, I mean, they sense things. I mean, they, they sense things long before we do a lot of times. And so they're panicked. And so just getting them on on a good day, sometimes like in a horse trailer can be time consuming, et cetera. And, um, and that can be an issue. And say, what if you're not at your house and a fire breaks out? And it's like, uh oh, I've got to go get my, my animals. You know, I, I love these things. Uh, I'm going to go try to get them. A lot of times, you know, you're going to experience there's going to be a roadblock where law enforcement will not allow you to get into that site. Um, so there's loading issues. There's likely roadblocks. And even if you do get them, you've got to get them out. And we know a lot of the ranching communities in California, they're sort of a, you know, they're rural roads, kind of twisty, narrow things. They're sort of substandards. And, you know, if you've driven any of these trailers, you know that they can be unwieldy. It's not like riding on rails, you know, coming through. It's, a, it's not an easy go. So, all right, so there's issues with getting out. But then like with the barns, you know, we, uh, as Steve was showing earlier, you know, the barns can be very, very combustible. And I was speaking to a gentleman who lived through the Thomas fire and um, he was running a ranch where they had literally millions of dollars in Arabian uh, show horses. And he said it just broke his heart because he couldn't get them out because the fire had moved so fast. And, um, and so he was telling me, it's like, look, you know, just let's forget about even the, the price, you know, it's like if you're looking at this as an asset, uh, your animals, it's just this person is like, he had to sit there and listen to the horses, you know, screaming, knowing that they were burning to death. I mean, it's just a, a horrific, horrific thing. So what do you do? Well, it depends. And it, it's not so easy. So, but some best practices I've learned in terms of evacuation, just through experience and uh, just uh, talking with folks and different things is just sort of, this is sort of my framework is one is just be prepared. Um, especially if you live in rural areas, you should expect at some point that you're going to see a wildfire. And that doesn't matter if you're in the, uh, the, the, rainforest up in the uh, Humboldt County, you know, with the, the Redwoods, or if you're in Taft in the desert, you know, um, you're likely going to have a wildfire come to you. So you've got to have a plan and you've got to have a plan for yourself 
and for your livestock. And not only just having a plan, but you know, having a backup plan is in case something goes bad. And so, you know, it's like, well, how do I know if my plan's good? Well, you know, talk to your fire service folks. I mean, you know, we're, here, we're with the government, we're here to help. And so in my experience is they've been very general. It's like, yes, let, tell me what you're planning on doing. I can give you some feedback, yes or no. Can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you, here's some things to think about. So having a plan, having a backup plan for both you and your livestock is great. And then constantly being aware, you know, at any time we can experience wildfire in California. And as we've seen in so many, these things blow up really, really quick. So being cognizant of the weather forecast, you know, registering for 911, you know, reverse 911, that, uh, that you can, you know, if something breaks out, you're gonna know something very quickly. And finally, you know, just being decisive. Human nature, a lot of times, you know, animals, they see fire. What do they do? They run away. What do humans do? We take selfies. Uh, and so the, you can't sit around and just kind of wait. It's like, oh, let's see how bad this is going to be. Um, because you can very quickly uh, be cut off um, from, from your escape if that is your plan. So some other best practices, again, just think about, it's like, all right, well, we're going to go down this road and we're going to get out. Well, what if that road is blocked? What if the fire is coming from that way? You've got to have alternative evacuation routes. Um, and in the absence of alternative evacuation routes, recognize that not everyone can get out, is to utilize perhaps you know, temporary refuge areas. Um, it's perhaps not your first option, uh, but it is an option that's gonna be a survivable space. And this could be from, you know, we've seen this in large parking lots, uh, in the ranching community. I've seen, you know, it's like uh, uh, some of the ranchers in our area, they purposely disc up some of their fields uh, that they have, some of their rangelands. They know full well, it's like, yeah, this is an economic hit, but uh, this is for safety purposes and they, they take that hit. And in some places you've got neighbors that kind of come through with large areas and they kind of like, literally they trade pasture from pasture to pasture from year to year. It's kind of like this uh, uh, temporary refuge place. And in the case right here, this is a photo you see of the cows up uh, in the left-hand side. That was from the Tubbs fire. Uh, there was no one there to get the cattle, but the cattle were smart and they actually found what we call in the fire service, good black. Uh, there was a prescribed fire that was happening uh, that happened just a couple months before and the cattle were smart. They all ran uh, to the area that had previously been burned. Uh, I'm sure that they were terrified, but they were able to survive. And finally, you know, the sort of best practice kind of coming looking out is just another suggestion is that, you know, we mentioned before that there's the potential for, um, um, for inability to get into your property to get your livestock because of roadblocks. And so being able to partner before there's ever any of the first spark, you know, with the fire service and law enforcement to be able to have some organized group that, you know, you're working together is incredibly helpful. And so in our county, we have the, the slow heat team, you know, the San Luis Obispo horse emergency evacuation team. And they work with uh, Cal Fire and the local fire agencies, as well as our local sheriffs in the county uh, beforehand. They train together, they talk about it, they have official paperwork so that if they come up upon a roadblock, they can say, hey, Mr. Sheriff, I'm, you know, <laughs> I've got my papers, I, I've been here, I, I'm kind of trained for this and they're able to get in. And so I've seen this uh, work well before where roadblocks, nobody can get in. Uh, folks are coming in with their trailers, you know, to get into and get to their livestock. So finally, I'll just leave you with this. There are resources that are available um, going on. So if you're trying to protect yourself, your horses or <laughs> camels, like we see in the bottom that's going on, that uh, there are some websites here. Uh, California Fire Science Consortium uh, tries to work really hard um, to get uh, kind of high-end science. I know most folks don't want to read a 30-page journal article. It's all science-y with a bunch of statistics. But we try to take that information and bring it down to a level that's much more understandable uh, to just uh, the, the folks that are out and doing it, that doesn't have the, the big background in wildfire. And some of the things ready for wildfire, uh, there's a great uh, checklist, this emergency evacuation guide you can see that's going on. 
And then finally, for your animals, you know, some of the things you might consider is just looking around. Uh, this is the, the Slow Heat Team, their website. I'm sure that anyone that has interest, they were more than happy to kind of share their experiences and their knowledge. And also, uh, they've got the NorCal Livestock Evacuation Team that was set up after the Tubbs fire. Uh, so these are folks that I'm, I know that I know would be, be happy to provide any sort of information or best practices that they've developed over the years. So should you stay? Should you go? It depends. It's your personal decision and there's a lot of factors, but be prepared, be aware, and be decisive. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it.